Welcome back, everybody, to our study in the Gospel of Matthew. Today we're going to continue through chapter 5. Now, over the last couple of videos, we've been working through Jesus' correction of the scribes and Pharisees' teaching of the Old Testament. Remember, we've gone through, up until this point, we've seen Jesus correcting the scribes and Pharisees' teaching on the topics regarding murder and anger. Um, lust, which was in verses 27 through 30 of chapter 5. Divorce, which was in verses 31 and 32. Oaths, which was in verses 33 through 37. So now we come to the fifth of six. There will be another one more after this one. But this one, the fifth one here that we come to is revenge, vengeance. So we find in these verses... Jesus referencing pharisaical teaching and application regarding revenge, and then correcting the pharisaical teaching and application regarding revenge. Again, this is what he's been doing over the last several verses. So before we get into the text, let's go ahead and go to our Lord in prayer. Pray with me. Father God in heaven, we give you praise, Lord, that your word is so beautiful. I give you praise for faithful men who have taught your word over the years, these teachers that you've given to the church as a gift, and given these men the gift of teaching. I give you praise for them, and I thank you so much how you've used them in my life. I pray that you use me in the same manner, not for my glory, but for the glory of Jesus, that he may be lifted up and seen as exalted by the people watching these videos. Lord Jesus, I pray... Um, all these things in your name. Amen. Okay, let's go ahead and turn to Matthew 5, verses 38 through 42, where we find Jesus speaking to his disciples primarily, right? He is primarily teaching his disciples. Secondarily, um, other Jews who have gathered up around now are listening to Jesus' words. Jesus says, You have heard that it was said... An eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles." Give to the one who begs from you, and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. Some people teach that these verses, that Jesus in these verses are teaching that Christians are to be pacifists to the point where they allow and, and, and don't address lawless anarchy, that they essentially just kind of fold like a lawn chair and not stand firm in addressing um, wrong or evil or sin. And we know that if you take the whole counsel of God, we know that's not true. That's not what he's teaching here. Because we know, I mean, even if you look at um, when Jesus cleansed the temple, which we find in the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of John, the details around that, where they were, de they were degrading and defaming the, the house of God, the temple. And so Jesus didn't fold like a lawn chair and um, not address that and let lawless anarchy just continue. He addressed it. Okay, he, 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 he came to the situation and he addressed it. And then we also see, if you turn with me to Galatians chapter 2, because we also see an example of Paul doing the same thing. Paul witnessed, saw a sin that his brother in Christ, Peter, walk, was walking in. And so instead of just not addressing it and letting, letting it go by and let Peter continue in this, in this, in this sin, Paul addresses it. And so Galatians 2 verses 11 through 12 show us that, that Paul didn't let evil continue without addressing it. Didn't let sin continue without addressing it. <coughs> Galatians 2 11 through 12. But when Cephas, that's Peter, came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. <coughs> For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. Peter, a Jew, eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, Peter drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. So here Peter's eating, hanging out with the, the, the Gentiles, but he sees Jews coming. And so Peter decides 
to stop hanging out with the Gentiles for fear of what the circumcision party, that's other Jews, would say about him. And so Paul saw this and it checks him, essentially says, what are you doing, dude? These Gentiles are brothers in Christ. You shouldn't be ashamed of sitting and eating with them. You shouldn't allow what other Jews say about you sitting with your brothers in Christ, these Gentiles dictate how you act towards them because now you're behaving and make a decision based off of what other people are going to say about you these jews are going to say about you and you're turning your back on your brother in christ and what god has called us the jew and gentile are one in christ so paul addresses this sin doesn't just let it go without addressing it so that's not what jesus is teaching he's not teaching in these verses to be pacifist to the point where we accept lawless anarchy However, he is teaching how we are to approach these situations, how the, the motive behind standing firm is what he's after here. Because remember, he's correcting the scribes and Pharisees' teaching. Now, the scribes and Pharisees that he's rebuking here, uh, the past verses, all the way into verse, chapter 6, where he calls them out um, for practicing their righteousness before men in, in 6 1, and then praying in front of large groups of people to be seen as this holier than thou um, person in, in verses 5 through 15, and then uh, rebuking them for they fast, but they do it in a way to bring glory to themselves, that the other people's eyes would be on them. So, what he's after is this self righteousness. Now specifically in these verses, this self-righteousness manifests itself in seeking revenge, retaliation, being uh, uh, looking for a vengeance over something maybe that you have been wronged. So that's what Jesus is doing in these verses here. He's not saying it's okay to be pacifist to the point where you accept lawless anarchy. No. He's saying that we are to stand firm, and he shows us how to stand firm in these verses. That the motive of the heart, the motivation behind the heart, who stands firm against sin and, and evil, must be of a right motive. Not a self-righteous motive, but a motive that loves that person and loves Christ and wants that person to love Christ. And so what we're going to see, we're going to go through these verses. Let's go to 38 first and look at Jesus referencing pharisaical teaching and in the application regarding um, revenge. So what he does here, he quotes from the Old Testament. He says, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Okay, so he's quoting the Old Testament. He's saying to his disciples, you have heard the scribes and Pharisees teaching on what is written in the Old Testament, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. We find this saying in Exodus 21, Leviticus 24, and Deuteronomy 19. Now this eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth, it's, it's one phrase in a long list of other phrases. Let me go through a couple of them with you. So in addition to an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, we find a hand for a hand, a foot for a foot, a burn for a burn, a wound for a wound, a bruise for a bruise, and a fracture for a fracture. See, what this law that God gave, okay, this is God giving the Israelites in Exodus, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy, this law, an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, a fracture for a fracture. He's saying that when a crime is committed, the punishment for the crime must be equal, must be the same. So, so what we're seeing here is within this law that God gave to the Israelites, that there's two divine purposes. The first is that this law was used by God to prevent further crime. Because think about it. Let's say you have a dude who walks up to another guy and just punches him in the, in the jaw and fractures his jaw, right? What would happen is, is that would essentially go to, to a group of people at court um, and they would make the decision that that in fact happened and the result of that then would be the guy who got his jaw fractured now is to punch the guy who punched him in the jaw, right? So what happens is when that happens and other people are witnessing this and seeing that the punishment for punching somebody in the jaw is getting punched in the jaw by that same person. And so that then would motivate, and, and, and the ideal situation would prevent other people from committing that same crime. So we see then, within this law, God used it to prevent further crime. 
And Deuteronomy tells us that in 1920. The rest shall hear and fear, and shall never again commit any such evil among you. That's the idea. You, you see it, and you don't want to engage in it. The second divine purpose that we see this eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth is to prevent excessive punishment. Think about it. Because the wicked heart, us in our unredeemed nature, B.C., before Christ, before the Holy Spirit abides in us, we want to respond to somebody who hurts us with more vengeance, with a, a more heavier revenge. So we want, if somebody was to punch you, an unredeemed person in the, in, the, in the jaw, that unredeemed person, because of pride operating in, in their lives, would want to punch the other person who punched him in the jaw and hit him in the gut or do something in addition to just punching him in the jaw because our wicked nature wants more. The person who hurt me needs to pay more than what they did to me. And so what this law did when he gave it to the Israelites is to prevent excessive punishment. It's an eye for an eye, not an eye for an eye and an ear. Okay? It's an eye for an eye. It, it prevents excessive punishment. So we see two divine purposes in that law. Again, this is Jesus quoting what God gave in the Old Testament. Um, and we see the, 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 the purpose behind why God gave it. Now, during this time in history, that's what I had mentioned is the guy who got punched would be the guy who then would punch the person back according to the law. <coughs> so if there was a crime committed, the a judge or group of people would ag agree to the point that it in fact was committed. And so the victim then would be the one who would punish the one that, uh, th that hurt him. That's how this thing would work. But when you step back and, and look at the law itself, there's a couple of things that we see, a couple of characteristics that we see about the one who gave the law. Again, who gave the law? God. God gave the law. He's the law giver. And so when you look at the law, you see a couple of characteristics of the law giver within the law. Like we mentioned before, um, it being an eye for an eye, it being a, a, a just punishment. So we know that God is just, therefore the law that he gave is also just, right? And we see that in the fact that it's an eye for an eye. And that it's, it's a fair punishment that matched the crime. So we see just in that. God is just, therefore he gave the law, and the law then therefore is just. Let's look at the second one. Second characteristic that we see about the one who gave the law. And that is, God is merciful, right? So therefore, the law that he gave is also merciful. Merciful. And how, so how is an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth law, how is that merciful? Well, we talked about it before. It prevents excessive punishment. It's actually merciful to the one who commits the crime. Because then the punishment on them is merciful because it stays at the same level of the crime they committed. It doesn't go beyond that. There's mercy in that. That it is, in fact, an eye for an eye and not an eye for an eye and an ear or whatever else it may be. But the, 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 we see that God is merciful and therefore the law that he gave here is merciful. The problem, of course, is man's wicked, sinful vengeance is never satisfied with that. They always want more. One of the, one of the pastors or commentaries of books that I read throughout this, that... Wicked men want a pound of flesh for an ounce of wrongdoing. We want to hurt somebody more than when they hurt us because we have that vengeance in us running through our veins. So this is what Jesus is tapping into, he's getting to showing us the pride in our lives and how that operates, the self-righteous pride in our unredeemed sinful lives, okay? Even after coming to Christ, we still battle with this sin in the sin in the flesh. But what he's doing, he's getting to the root, the pride, and opening it up and showing us how 
our wicked nature operates in, in the form of this revenge. So in verse 38, he's referencing pharisaical teaching in the application regarding um, revenge. Now what he's going to do is he's going to correct it because the scribes and Pharisees have been teaching, false teaching regarding revenge, okay? Regarding the eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Because they're teaching, because they themselves were walking in self-righteous revenge. So now he's going to correct it. And he corrects it in verses 39 through 42. Let's go ahead and look at uh, the first part of 39 first. He says, But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. He says, do not resist the one who is evil. When you read that for the first time, at least when I read this for the first time, I thought, how is that possible? How am I to resist the one who has caused me pain and hurt me and wronged me? How is that even possible? Have authentic resisting of the one who is evil. How is it possible? Well, there's two answers, I believe, to that. The first one, the first answer is a general answer. It's possible um, only through a having a new heart. Because the wicked, sinful heart, the unredeemed, unrepentant, unforgiven heart, can't. We, you cannot do it. It can only happen with a new heart, the redeemed heart, with the Holy Spirit abiding in the individual. So apart from being born again and the Holy Spirit abiding in us, we cannot authentically forgive and resist the evil one who is evil, the one who has wronged us. We want our sin, and an and unredeemed heart wants revenge to the 10th degree. So it's only through the power of the Holy Spirit dwelling within the believer, working through the believer for this to even be possible. Well, how is that even possible then? I mean, so the Holy Spirit abides in us, so how does it work? Well, this is how it works. We recognize that to authentically and completely forgive someone who's wronged us, who's wronged me, I must recognize that I have been authentically and completely forgiven for the wrongs that I've done to other people, but primarily for the wrongs that I've done to God, which are far worse, the sins that I've done to God. In order for me to love the dude who has wronged me, I've got to recognize that I am that dude, that I've done the same things. I'm no different than that person. And see, so the redeemed heart, the believer in Jesus Christ, the born-again, authentic follower of Jesus, Holy Spirit abiding in us, recognize that I've been forgiven at the cross. And that I'm called to then let that forgiveness flow through me to those who have wronged me. Can't do it apart from the Holy Spirit abiding in us. Because we see the truth in the verse in Romans, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All. All. That includes me, and that includes the dude who has wronged me. That included in the all. So I'm no different than that person. That's what we got to understand. We can't miss that fact. Because the unrepentant, unredeemed um, enemy of God who have rejected Jesus Christ, they believe that they're not part of the all there. The for all have sinned. They believe they're apart from that. That they're not included in that all. I... I, I I haven't, I'm a good dude. I haven't done anything wrong. So to authentically forgive the one who has wronged us, we have to recognize that that's just me. I've done the same thing. We see our own sinful nature and sin in that in other person. And we see God's grace given to us at the cross where we then can forgive that other person. So that's the general answer as to how we are to uh, resist the one who is evil that Jesus tells us in verse 39. Now, the second answer are, is, are practical answers, like the applicable. How do, how, now that we have the general idea, because we have the Holy Spirit abiding in us, but how do we practice those things out? How do we walk those things out? What specifically do we do? What are some examples, practical examples of doing this very thing? Well, Jesus gives them to us in the rest of these verses. He gives us four 
practical answer, answers on, and, uh, as to how to resist the one who is evil. Now, remember, he's sp primarily speaking to his disciples. He's giving his disciples four practical um, answers as to how to do this. Now, we learn from this. We see in which the context that this is taught to them and how it applies to us through the Holy Spirit revealing that to us. So let's walk through the rest of these verses and see the four practical answers that Jesus gives us. So here's the first one, at the rest, the, the rest of verse 39. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Okay, so if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. You gotta understand, look at that word slaps. In the ESV, I, I have the word slaps in front of me. You gotta understand what, what, what the depths of what that means to somebody. Because in the Jewish culture, just like in today's culture, when someone slaps you on the face, that's the, one of the most, if not the most, demeaning, disrespectful, dishonorable things that you can do to somebody. I mean, think about it, as a dude, right? Honestly, ask this question, as a dude. I know. If I had to choose between getting punched with a closed fist on my face as opposed to getting open-handed slapped on my face, I'd pick the closed-fisted punch because the open-handed slap is super demeaning, especially to a man in his pride to be slapped across the face or even maybe backhand across the face like that. So that slap is, is, is different than being punched. It's, it, 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 that open hand smacking cuts even deeper to the pride issue that we have in our heart because it's even more demeaning, especially to a man. So we see, however, Jesus had both done to him. If you go to Matthew 26, we'll find verse 67 and 68 we're going to see that Jesus walks, walks through the very same thing he's telling us in the end of verse 39 that we're studying. Matthew 26, verse 67. Then they spit in his face and struck him. Now we see, I see struck and I think close-handed punch, okay? Because then he says, and some slapped him, open-handed slapping, saying to him, prophesy to us, you Christ, who is, who is that, who is it that struck you? So we see Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount telling us, if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. So what does Jesus do? Right before he's getting crucified, and the Roman soldiers are spitting on him, struck him on the face and open-handed smacked him across the face and, and mocked him by saying, prophesy to us, you Christ, who is it that struck you? How did Jesus respond to that? Turn the other cheek. Silence. Matter of fact, when he was on the cross, he prayed for the very people that were doing that to him. So we see Jesus modeling this very thing right before he's crucified and while he's getting crucified. Turning the other cheek. And so you've got to understand, what, what does that symbolize? Turning the, being slapped across the face in that demeaning manner with the open hand and turning the other cheek. That symbolizes and communicates humility and gentle spirit, which is characterized by those in the kingdom of God and who have the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit abiding in us, which we saw in the Beatitudes, the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. He talked about that, the gentleness, the humble, contrite, meek. That's exactly what marks those who are in the kingdom, born again. All right, so that's the first practical answer to how is it even possible that Jesus gives us. Let's look at the second one. Verse 40, he says, And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. There's something you gotta, you got to make sure you understand and, and don't miss this about this verse. Who's the one getting sued? Because who's the one that's done something wrong which then has resulted in them getting sued? And if anyone would sue you. So in this verse here, you're the one who's done the wrong. You're the one being sued. Okay, so, so you're, in, you're, you're, you're the guilty one. Okay, you're at fault. 
Let's not miss that. So when he says, take your tunic, they sue you for your tunic. Again, we read this verse and we read the next verse, verse uh, 41, and we, uh, we don't really understand what's going on here because in order to understand it, we've got to understand the context in which it was written and how it was delivered to the disciples during this time frame. Because without that, we don't understand the depths of what's being taught. And so to understand that, we know that during this time, people didn't have a lot of money. Their possessions essentially were their clothes. And so when somebody was to be sued, somebody who didn't have a lot of stuff, they would go to court and if then somebody else sued and, and that person would have won, then they would sue them for their clothes because a tunic is a t-shirt, is a shirt, that you, it's an undergarment. So people would actually be sued for their t-shirt because that's all they had, the belongings that they owned. And so Jesus says, when this happens, when you've wronged somebody, and they sue you for your tunic, your undergarment. Don't just give them your tunic, your, your t-shirt, your undergarment, but give them your cloak, which is your outer garment. It's your coat that they would wear. Matter of fact, this cloak was probably the most valuable thing they had because the cloak was used as a blanket at night. So Jesus is saying to communicate the depths of your guilt, that you see that you're guilty, and the depths and desire that you are seeking after their forgiveness, because you're the guilty one, that you not only, when they sue you for your t-shirt, your tunic, you not only give them that, but you give them your cloak also, because it communicates someone, it, it communicates that at the heart is identifying that it was guilty and is seeking the forgiveness of the one that I've wronged. That's what he's saying in verse 41. Now, I'm sorry, in verse 40, in verse 40. Now let's move to verse 41 where we see the third practical application of how to do this, how to resist the one who is evil. Verse 41, and if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Now, again, to understand this, you've got to understand the context of the time, the culture of the time that Jesus is speaking to his disciples. Because they completely and, 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 and immediately understood what Jesus is getting at. See, during this time, the Roman soldiers, these are the Rome, the oppressed, oppressors of the Jewish people, right? Roman rule over the Jewish people. There was a law that Roman soldiers had the right to make any Jew, any civilian, carry their sword, their shield, their helmet, their boots, their shin guards. They had the right to do that for a mile. So if I'm a Roman soldier and I didn't want to carry my shield, my, uh, my vest, my helmet, my sword, and shin guards, and I saw a Jew walking down the street, by law I could make them carry my stuff for a mile. So what Jesus is saying is when this Roman soldier does that, be a light for me by willingly carry it for a mile, but carry it for two miles. Go above and beyond what they're asking you. And don't just do it in a whiny, crybaby, miserable way. I'll carry your sword and shield, Roman soldier, for two, two miles. No. He's saying, do it with a heart of love to serve this, uh, this other person so that my light will shine through you to them and they'll see what an authentic disciple of mine looks like. So go with them too. Another practical, because remember, this is the person, this is the civilians walking down the street and a Roman soldier comes over there and by law just hammers down the fact that you've got to carry my stuff. Man, that, think about that. Think about um, a man with his wife and kids and some Roman soldier coming over and making him do that, making him submit to that right in front of his wife and his kids. And, and from a pride perspective, how demeaning that would be for that person, how it attacks our wicked pride that we have running through our veins. And so Jesus says, set that aside and serve the Roman soldier that's making you do this by going um, two miles instead of one. And so now we get to verse 42, where it's the fourth applica practical application that he gives us. He says, Give to the one who begs from you, and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. So what he's saying is, when someone asks to borrow something from us, we shouldn't turn away from him, but give him what he needs. Now this is important because the implication here is that there is a genuine need. That there's this person, an individual who is in need, who is in desperate need. 
and does not have the means, the ability to fulfill that need. It is different than uh, something uh, toxic charity, for example. Somebody who's you know somebody who sits on the uh, the couch in the basement um, of their parents' house, let's say, with Cheeto sauce all over their shirt and all over their fingers, playing video games for days and days and months and months, and and says to you, "Hey, man, I need a couple of hundred bucks to, to get something to eat," but he's not willing to go out and get a job. He's a sluggard. The, the implication here is that there is authentic, genuine need for somebody. Somebody has a need. He says, "Give it to him." Because we know that the toxic charity, the one who is down in the basement of his parents' house with Cheetos all over him playing video games for days on end, not willing to go work, by continuing to give him money for food and, 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 and Mountain Dew or another video game, all we're doing is feeding into his sin. We're helping him continue his life of habitual sin by, again, being a slugger. So Jesus is speaking to, uh, uh, of the one who is in, in actual need, that we, as his disciples, should be willing and generous and loving um, to serve those who are in need by giving. Generosity that genuinely wants to meet another person's needs. Not because it makes me feel good or makes me look good, but because it makes Jesus look good. As, as we are lights for him. Because there's a difference, man. There's a difference. And I know you've done it before. And I know I've done it before. Where you do something good and you say something like, yeah, I did that. It made me feel real good. The motivation shouldn't be us in our own feelings. I did it because it made me feel good. I gave this. I helped this person because it made me feel good. The motivation shouldn't be me focused or my feelings focus. The motivation should be to glorify the Lord Jesus by being an effective ambassador for Him. To love this person so that they will love Jesus and see Jesus, the love of Jesus coming through us to them. That's the motivation. Not to glorify self like the scribes and Pharisees were doing, which Jesus is correcting, but to glorify the Lord Jesus Himself. And so, again, in these verses, we see Jesus continuing to walk through um, correcting the scribes and Pharisees' teaching of Old Testament. He's not, Jesus is not correcting the Old Testament. He's correcting the scribes and Pharisees' false teaching and interpretation of the Old Testament. He's showing us what the Old Testament actually means, actually, and revealing, uh, fulfilling the Old Testament, which we read and studied in verses uh, 17 through 20 of chapter 5. So let's go ahead and read these verses one last time, and then we will pray out. So this is the fifth of six corrections of the Pharisees' teaching, scribes and Pharisees' teaching. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Just like Jesus did at the cross and before the cross. When they spit on him, they punched him, they slapped him, they put the, thorn, the crown of thorns on his head. It's exactly what he did. Verse 40. And if anyone would sue you, take your tunic. To take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. If they sue you for your tunic and you're guilty, give them the cloak, your coat, to show them that you recognize your own guilt and that you are seeking their forgiveness authentically. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. Pray with me. Lord, these verses, they really, really check us, Lord. This is an attack on our sinful flesh. It is, you're calling us to crucify the flesh, to lay it aside and to follow you in these things. It's hard, Lord, but we give you praise that you've done it. And so all we do is trust in you and follow you and we see these things manifest themselves in our lives. We can't explain it. Lord, we ask that you help us to be better and more effective ambassadors for you, lights for you here in this dark world. We love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. 
Amen.